Next up, we have Representative Liz Lagard. Welcome to the Education Finance Committee again. And with that, go ahead and I will move House File 4986 before the committee with the intention to re-refer it to the Committee on Taxes. Go ahead and start your um, presentation. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I appreciate the time uh, in committee today. Uh, Minnesota has a long history of supporting public education, but we've got a problem when a quarter of our schools, uh, school districts are falling behind with operating um, referendum. Um, to be fair, the operating referendum was supposed to be for extras, but we all know that dollars um, simply going to pay bills, cover student services, and to try and pay a competent uh, wage for staff. The districts I'm talking about, um, a lot of them, they can't pass an operating um, levy. Um, and, and now there's a lot of reasons why that is, but um, I'm startled when I look at the map, which I believe all of the, you guys have in front of you, and I see that most of these zero districts are in central and northern Minnesota, the same communities where there's a lot of seasonal and recreational property that isn't contributing to the local school operating levy. Um, I understand that previous generations of legislators decided that these properties should stay into the state levy um, instead, but my bill doesn't change that at all. I'm important for that. What this bill does is bill creates a seasonal recreation tax based replacement aid aimed at reducing local tax efforts required for voter, voter approval. The bill does not give school boards additional levy authority as the voters must still be asked to vote yes. This bill is especially impactful to school districts with a very substantial amount of seasonal recreational um, residential property. The bill would reduce the tax effort by as much as 50% in districts where the cabin market value represents a substantial portion of the total market value. Again, the bill does not change how cabins are taxed. Um, with me today, I have uh, Superintendent of Masabi East, um, the, the school that is in my district. Um, um, Jeff um, it brought this to me and we've had discussions over a period of time. And what's important to know is we do have equalization. This um, bill is similar, but this is a new concept. And there is a fiscal note of, I believe it's 8.4 million. And I know that, um, you know, the targets came out as a chair. I know that um, that kind of, you know, narrows things in there. But this conversation needs to happen because there are certain school districts, there's 92 that can't pass an operating levy because we don't have the tax wealth. And um, the superintendent is gonna read you kind of what the cost would be to pass the same dollar amount in different districts. So, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Before we go to the Superintendent. Madam Chair, I just upgraded you. <laughs> uh, before we go to your testimony, I think we'll go to Mr. Strom to explain one of his lovely spreadsheets that he has in the packet. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, in your packet is a spreadsheet that's got a few pieces of information on it. Uh, it's a district by district list, and if you look at the uh, second column in after the pupil units, that's the tax base that Representative Liz Lagarde mentioned that is used to equalize referendum levies. It's something we refer to as referendum market value tax base, and that's the assessed market value of all the property within that district, excluding two classes of property. The excluded property are ag lands, other than the house garage at one acre, and the seasonal recreational values. That's the next column that's listed are those seasonal recreational values. So you can see on the total line, there's $843 billion of referendum market value. Uh, another $43.5 million is seasonal rec property that is not included in that tax base. So what this printout does then is models Representative Liz Lagarde's bill. It shows the ratio in the next column of seasonal rec property uh, of RMV to, to the new base if seasonal rec were to be added to it, creates the ratio the bill requires that uh, shows the amount that would be paid, essentially the, the last column then showing the amount that would be paid uh, uh, if this bill were enacted. And the, the fourth to the last column shows that referendum allowance that Representative Liz Lagarde mentioned. You can see just at the, at the first district listed, Aiken. Aiken has not passed an operating referendum. 
As a result, they have an allowance of $0 per pupil. So on the printout, even though they're at 45% of potential levy reduction because they have zero as a referendum allowance and zero referendum levy, uh, they're showing a zero impact. So the cost that's shown on this printout in the second to last column, $8.35 million is the cost of this additional tax base replacement aid presuming no behavioral changes. If a district were to pass a referendum, uh, you can use that last column to, uh, to uh, see the amount of the referendum levy that would be uh, picked up by the new tax base replacement aid. Uh, so once again, the printout static and uh, uh, shows the impact on those districts that currently have a referendum and does not presume a behavioral shift. Thank you, Mr. Strom. And with that, members, um, folks have driven a long ways to get down here, so I want to give them a chance to testify. We may be going a few minutes over um, committee time today. We've got permission to do that. And this is the one bill we are moving out, so please stick around. Um, with that, Superintendent, please state your name for the record. Proceed. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Jeff Burgess. I'm the superintendent of Misabi East uh, Public School District. Um, thank you, Chair, and also the committee for hearing testimony. Um, Couple things about our district. Um, you know, you have the MREA map in front of you with a uh, large disparity in districts that can pass operating referendums. There's also a large disparity in the resources that we can offer our students. When looking at my school district, um, we have a large percentage of low, low household income. We also have about a 50% free and reduced lunch rate at our district, which means 50% of my students qualify for free and reduced lunches. We have about 900 students. Um, when looking at the tax base of my current district, about 30% of our current property is state or federal land, which means I have a large chunk of the, the tax base, which is already out. Add on to that seasonal rec, and that brings my tax base um, pretty far down. So looking at, for me to pass an oper operating referendum in my district, a $500 operating referendum would bring in about $450,000 per year. Looking at how that impacts the taxpayers of my district, um, that would cost a $200,000 household about $168 per year. Now, in our region, that is a, a rather large hike in the amount of taxes. But looking at the differences between us and other districts, um, if you look at Duluth to pass the same amount of referendum, it would cost their taxpayers on a $200,000 house $87 per year, and it would cost a Bloomington household of $200,000 $65 per year. So for me to pass a $500 operating referendum, it costs one and a half to two times, sometimes two and a half times, as much as other districts. So looking at that, there's quite a disparity in the amount of taxes per household um, to pass the same dollar amount per, per student. So with this bill, it would be a 20% reduction in the first $500, which would bring our dollar amount from 168 down to 134 as a tax impact for my for my taxpayers. Now, um, it's helpful. It'll help me get that, get that, hopefully get that through to, to provide the resources for my students. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's still a, a thing that we, we would have to pass. Now, looking at the impact on students, about $400,000 per year would do a long ways to help keep some of the resources that I've cut over the pre previous three years. Um, in each of the last three years, I've cut about $400,000 from my district. Um, some of the cuts that we've made have been social worker, school nurse, industrial tech, elementary, English, choir, SPED, check and connect, and numerous support staff. Um, this is an issue that is very important to me. Getting any funding I can to help keep some of these positions is extremely important um, because I want to be able to offer the same resources to my students that uh, other districts can offer as well. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. And as a reminder, as we've talked about equalization in this committee, equalization <laughs> is here for levies, but we haven't rebased it or changed it for quite a while. So districts like Dr. Burgess, is, um, even that equalization is mostly going under the tax base instead of coming from state aid. Um, with that, we'll go to our next testifier. We have uh, Paul Boutier, Executive Director from Range Area Municipal um, Schools. All remotely, so no, oh, here's here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming all the way down here. Um, Dr. Burgess, if you just wanna move over and we'll yeah. switch out as people have questions. Dr. Peltier, please state your name for the record. Proceed. Upgraded. I'm not a doctor. I don't even Director. play one on TV. Director. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Committee. My name is Paul Peltier. I'm the Executive Director of RAMS, the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools, and I'm here on behalf of RAMS as well as the Minnesota Rural Education Association and my colleague, Sam Walseth. Um, together, we represent over 237 member districts in rural Minnesota, 15 of which occur on the Iron Range, and those are my, my home turf. Um, one of the themes that you uh, are the carriers of in this, um, in this last legislative session and this one is fixing disparities, whether it's a rural disparity, uh, an education disparity, a racial disparity, a uh, financial disparity, that is kind of the mandate for the last year in this, uh, in this body. And we've heard the stories about the disparities that are coming to light as we exit the COVID era. And in greater Minnesota, the financial disparity is especially glaring. And that's not only in greater Minnesota, it is something that we see statewide in various economic regions of the state, and we would do well to pay attention to that. Um, what we're asking for here through this bill authored by Rep. Lissigard, and thank you, Rep., for bringing this bill today, as well as for all the stakeholders engaged, is to have a chance at a conversation. Right now, a lot of our communities are precluded from that because we just don't have the financial horsepower in our tax base to make that conversation happen. Um, equalization comes in many forms, and although this is a new conversation, this particular me mechanism is a new conversation of the legislature and school funding, we believe it's an important one looking forward, and we're really grateful for the attention brought to this, and um, you know, in, in, in honor that uh, sometimes brevity is better, I'll, I'll leave it there. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Executive Director Peltier. Next up, we have Carol Lopp, seventh grade cop, seventh grade teacher from Grand Rapids. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Carol Kopp and I teach seventh grade language arts in Grand Rapids. I'm here today in support of House File 4986 and would like to thank Representative Lisselgard for bringing this forward. A student's educational experience should not be limited by the zip code in which they reside. Students in Warba, Cass Lake, and Big Fork, to name a few, deserve the same educational opportunities as students in Edina, Bloomington, or Wyzetta. Education funding must be fixed. While 70% of districts in the state of Minnesota have an operating levy, 30% do not, including Grand Rapids. The majority of the 30% that don't have an operating levy are in Greater Minnesota, as Representative Lisselgards mentioned. Last fall, my district had an operating levy on the ballot and it failed miserably, which is when this conversation began. Greater Minnesota has world-class teachers, students, and programming. What it doesn't have is funding. When our referendum failed, we knew that we wouldn't have the necessary funding, meaning more cuts. Over the last five years, my district has cut $8.9 million, 43 teachers, 23 educational support professionals, technology, activities, transportation, the list goes on and on. Without funding from the state or a past referendum, I fear that my district and many like mine will continue to struggle. This bill would not fix all of our issues, but it's a start to fixing the funding gap that exists in Minnesota's often touted educational system. My, stu my students deserve a superior education one without bandages and duct tape holding it together. They deserve an education where they don't have to sit in study halls for two hours each day due to lack of programming. Yes, I know, last year, districts received historic funding. However, chronic underfunding of education will not be fixed in one year. That money did not go to my class budget. That money did not go to hiring more teachers. That money helped slow the bleeding for one more year. Minnesota owes my students and students in greater Minnesota the same educational opportunities that students in the metro receive. Please support HF 4986 so my district, like many others, can begin to rebuild. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have um, John Ward, Brainerd School Board. Also on remote, please state your name for the record and proceed. We might be having some technical difficulties here. Let's give it a second. Madam Chair, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, committee members, um, my name is John Ward. I'm a former state representative and also a former educator and coach of 34 years and a current school board member in Brainerd. 
Um, I want to talk about the six districts in our area, Brainerd, uh, Aiken, Pine River, Pequot Lakes, Pillager, and C Crosby Ironton, who are all talking about making substantial cuts due to the lack of funding. Um, and we appreciate the funding that we that we received last year, as Ms. Cop said. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, as she said, we can't we can't uh, uh, create the funding that is needed in just one year. So I want to give you folks the, uh, and I want to thank uh, Madam Chair and the committee members, um, also Representative Les Lagarde for, for listening to this bill and considering it. It is very, very much needed in greater Minnesota as has been indicated with the 92 school districts that don't have um, operating levies, but have most of them have high uh, percent of seasonal rec property within them. So the cuts that our area is talking about looking at um, eliminating classes, cutting curricular, extra and co-curricular, uh, cutting teachers, increasing class sizes, um, cutting uh, support staff, and, the, and that's really important, cutting support staff, especially teaching assistants. When we are looking at the uh, READ Act, which is very, very critical in the state, you all know that, and one of the things that we can do with the READ Act, one of the things we need to do with the READ Act is having teaching assistants in those K through three grades um, that um, will make an impact on the literacy programs and so um, cutting support staff is really critical uh, for educational journeys. Um, we are going to uh, look at cutting, schools are looking at cutting transportation routes and cutting transportation in general, cutting mental health services, guidance services, nursing services, cutting special programs that keep our students in our schools, like alternative education, career pathways, and other unique programs um, that we try to offer in order to increase our student population with a chronic and, and uh, nationwide uh, de decreasing student population happening. Um, we also want to make sure that um, we have uh, classes offered uh, that our business partners uh, tell us are critical and important uh, for them to have the employees that they need. Um, also is considering a redesign or a reassignment of early childhood programs, which are the <laughs> programs that have the building blocks for uh, future success of our, of our ch children in their educational journey. Um, there's districts that are looking at eliminating community ed directors, cutting coaching positions, combining junior and senior high activity travel, eliminating overnight travel, um, reducing co and, co and extracurricular uh, seasons. Um, I mean, that's just a few of the uh, cuts that are being talked about in our area and our districts and that will be impactful for our students, our staff, our families and our communities. And the last thing that I want to just point out that hasn't been talked about yet, while last year the legislature approved um, those that have operating levies um, are now going to be able to renew them without having to go back to the uh, voters, um, that is wonderful. That is a piece that's been long time needed, and we applaud the legislature for doing that. However, those of us in the state of Minnesota that do not have operating levies, um, we are going to create a larger financial disparity with those districts that do have operating levies and those that don't. So again, this bill, this bill is critical for those of us in the state of Minnesota that don't have operating levies, the 92 of us, and have a high percent of seasonal recreational property. We ask for your support for House File 4986. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing us to testify and tell you the importance of that. Thank you, former Representative Ward and school board member. With that, members will bring the question <coughs> questions to the table. <coughs> Representative Senator Murrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for bringing this bill. I know that it might not be something that we can get done this year, but I think it's really important uh, for us. I know there's, there's different reasons why districts struggle to pass levies, but I know we've heard just a lot of heartbreaking stories about what that means for students on the ground. And so I think this is an important bill and I hope it's a discussion that we can keep having in education finance. Thank you, Representative Senator Mara. Um, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative Lizagard. I, I certainly understand why your schools are in the place they're, they're at um, and why you're bringing this forward. But, here, but I guess I'd just like to make a comment. What I'm struggling with is I, I heard those testifiers and it breaks my heart, you know, having to cut mental health services, having to cut teachers, paras, um, all these various things these schools are under, and yet schools received 
millions of dollars more than they've ever received last year. And so I guess the comment I'll make is this is needed, but it's needed because we, we put 65 new mandates on schools last year. It cost like a billion dollars more for schools. So we put them in a huge place where I can understand why they're looking for any flexible dollar that they can. Um, we have to be so careful what we do. I, we need to fix what we did last year and this will help your schools. I, I want to help them, but my goodness, let's stop putting uh, money in one pocket and pulling it out of the other pocket for our school district. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Representative Reed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I really appreciate all the work you're doing to champion the areas um, that we don't think about a lot. Um, when I was growing up, we spent a lot of time up north and really enjoyed cabin country and all the beauty that the northern areas provide, but we don't really think a lot about the kids who live up there. Um, and so on a day like today, I think about like, how do these kids get to school? You know, what kind of busing do they have? What, what's that like to be a kid up north? Um, and I think, you know, we can't forget about these kids up um, in the rural areas, and I think it's really important that we are opening up this discussion. Um, and the other thing I would say is, uh, I think it was the testifier, uh, I think it was Carol Cup, who talked about how, you know, they'd have to cut this funding, um, even with all the funding that we did provide last session. You know, we can't make up for all the chronic underfunding in one session. So thank you so much for bringing this forward, and I look forward to seeing some progress being made. Thank you, Representative Reem, and um, thank you, Representative Liscard, for bringing this forward and the creative approach. And just a qualifier here, I keep hearing this number 65 being thrown around. That is an old number that started at the beginning of the session. More than happy to give you the list from MSBA myself to show you that it's fewer. So this kind of goes to say the number enough, and it sounds like it's true. But just wanted to correct that because we need to. With that, members, I think I'll give the final word to Representative Liscard. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the dialogue and I appreciate the comments. But when you think about the 92 schools, it's not like they didn't try to pass an operating levy, right? And so um, th that's telling. And, right, so then when you dig down deep, why is that? And then how do we find a way to be able to help these schools, which is basically helping our communities? And so, um, you know, when you heard the superintendent, say those numbers, right? 160 some to, you know, all the way down to down in the Bloomington, uh, $69. There's no money up there. We don't have the wealth, but yet we have seasonal rec and we're not raising taxes on nobody. This is a new aid, a new program. I think it's creative. I didn't come up with it, right? <laughs> but I mean, I seriously, as we move forward, whether it gets across the finish line this year or not, we do have to um, be creative. We do have to find a solution to be able to help communities regardless of their zip code. And obviously the data is showing that in greater Minnesota, it, 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 we're, we're struggling more. So thank you so much for giving us the hearing and moving this bill forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Representative Liz Lagard. And with that, I will renew the motion to re-refer House File 4986 to the Tax Committee. And you're on your way. And oh, oh, we got a vote. <laughs> that would probably be important. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Uh, with that, House File 4986 has been re-referred to taxes. Now you are on your way.